Okay, right. Let's find Susan. Well, you're Dr. Susan Dye, and we can see. No, this, no, no, um, no, 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 I'm not you're a doctor. Not Dr. No, <laughs> oh, I'm getting muddled with Joe. Joe is, I know. Susan and um, uh, she had a colleague, as you could see up there, um, Ashley Walker and Brian Bond. They did some experiments, and I believe your academic backgrounds are in psychology. Is that right? Uh, yeah, mine is, in psych mine is psychology, Ashley's is biology and geology, and Brian's is statistics. Ah, uh, he's the statistician. Okay. I was going to say psychology usually calls for an excellent working knowledge of stats and, and the skill here is that the three of you have actually applied to dyeing wool with weld. Um, I would also recommend a visit to the accompanying kiosk in our team suite where this study is illustrated by an excellent poster with a link to a web page for details. And they produced their dye plants at a garden in Hitchin, Hertfordshire in the UK. Well, special welcome, Susan. Very big welcome from me because your um, your techie knowledge um, has been an absolute gift. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jenny. I think um, we will get through these teething problems before we're to the end of the day, I'm sure. Thank you for that. So what people are doing is using a browser to follow the slide and I shall talk through Verbella. Okay, or Verbella, not sure how I should say that. So here we go then, I shall assume that I'm carrying at least some, some of you guys with me. Um, so find yourself on page one. Uh, I will scoot through Jenny and try. So. Um, Jenny mentioned that there are three of us who did this experiment. Um, Brian is featured in the middle picture on the on page one uh, in a blue woad jumper, removing a weld skein from a bowl of dye. Um, we uh, are not chemists. We do not understand what's going on in the dye baths, on the fibre or with the modern thing. So this experiment was undertaken very much in the spirit of the empirical approach and how could we improve our process, understand better our process of producing yellows with weld. And I mentioned Brian's a statistician and he specialises in helping scientists refine process. Um, so this was this was terrific. So I'm moving on to slide two, which should be a picture of some skeins of yellow yarn dyed with weld and then some coloured um, balls of wool. Weld is really great because it's really pretty colour fast. It was in the Grand Tente and uh, super for over dyeing. Listening to Rika was so interesting because she mentioned the fact that we have attitudes, opinions and, and, and sort of embedded cultural values re related to colour and she's made me realise that what I was going to say on this slide was I love the acid yellow, the really zingy electric yellow that Weld produces. It doesn't always produce that. Sometimes it produces a more sort of somber straw colour. I'm going to call it straw colour, um, a sort of duller, warmer tone. And of course, I love the acid yellow because it over dyes to produce such um, shocking bright greens and oranges. Um, but I, Rika's making me think I, I must not apply any value judgments to the different colours I can get from this dye. So bear that in mind as we go on. So um, page two, uh, uh, we move on to slide three. So slide three, I've just included here a, um, a, a scan of a little piece of the a book from Hoffenk de Graaf, the wonderful book, The Colourful Past, which gives the chemical formulae or structures of the dyes in Weld. There are um, two, but the very big majority dye in Weld is luteolin, the structure on the left which has got three carbon rings and a link between two and the other one. And that's about all I could say about it. I know they're hydroxy groups. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But apigenin does interest me. And I do wonder whether there's something about what's going on when we get the different tones from well that might be linked to that. But I'd love to talk to somebody later about whether that might be possible. On to screen, I think this might be screen page four. Um, the aims for the experiment. Uh, we wanted to know what what changes in the in the dyeing process can we do can we use to get acid versus straw yellows? What affects the the, the, the quality of the colour? And in particular, weld is an adjective dye, so it needs to be used with a mordant. We were using alum here, aluminium potassium sulfate. Most recipes to do with alum dyeing also talk about an assistant uh, chemical that you add to improve the mordanting. Um, and that's most commonly cream of tartar. 
which I think is potassium hydrogen tartrate, but I, I'm not going, don't claim to understand what it's doing. We wanted to explore, does that matter? Personally, I've been buying in the past a crystalline form called Dyer's Cream of Tartar, and um, then suddenly I haven't been able to get that from a craft supplier anymore. Most people, I think, buy baking cream of tartar from, from you know, the baking cooking department of the, of, of the shops. And we were exploring um, the difference possibly between those two types. We did a quick scan uh, before the experiment of what recipes are recommended. You can see there was a big diversity, as Rika mentioned, in ratios of alum to weight of fiber from 25% down to about 10. In fact, less than 10 in some recipes. And also the cream of tartar proportions varies considerably across recipes. But most interestingly, um, you can see the third column from the, the right, the bar chart there, there's a 2007 recipe that recommends no cream of tartar at all. That's Jenny Dean, actually. And that also got us curious about working out why would, you know, Jenny Dean's a very well-respected dyer and she's recommending that cream of tartar, don't bother with it. Interesting. And I've looked at more recent dye books and you still see a big variety of recipes. So moving now on to slide six, you should be able to see um, a process chart of mordanting dye extraction, what the dye bath and fading or exposure to sun. I'm not going to go into this slide at all um, in detail. It's just to say that Brian advised we did a full factorial experiment we investigated all the permutations of the different variables on this slide. So we changed things to do with each of those main processes and uh, tried to choose levels that would give us a good, um, a good range of results. And that resulted in 384 yarn samples, which was a little bit crazy really, <laughs> but we had, we had actually four people helping with the experiment. So it wasn't, it was worth doing, it was well worth doing. A factorial experiment is great because it allows you to explore interactions. And the uh, effects I'm going to talk about briefly are all to do with um, mordanting and cream of tartar. So if we move on to slide, hopefully you're now on slide seven. Uh, that has a green bar at the top saying experimenting with welds on wall. I know you can't read this. This is just a reminder. Go and visit the kiosk and you can zoom in on this. You can uh, actually download the file, I think and um, read all about the experiment in detail there. Skipping on to slide eight. Um, what were the dependent variables? How did we measure the results? Well, we didn't have access to any clever machinery to do any spectrographic analysis. We just had the human eye. Um, we had three uh, people independently rank the samples in order of depth of color. So they put the palest at one end the darkest at the other and then shuffled the, the samples around until they were in order. I apologize for the photograph. It's not easy to capture color well and we had a fairly poor camera at the time, but we only really ranked, well, we only we definitely only ranked 48 samples, which was much more manageable than the full 384. But Brian used a, a respected sign, uh, statistical technique to select a representative subset from our big factorial experiment so that we just concentrated on a manageable number that would still give us some experimental power. So we, we have a measure of the intensity of the colour, and that is taken by averaging the ranks produced by the three people. And that's what you see in the graph. So if you move on to the next slide, which is slide nine, this is the only graph I'm going to give you. Uh, it shows alum concentration, which interacted. We found an interaction with Mordenting Assistant. The vertical axis here is a measure of the depth of colour. It's that average rank I just mentioned. So the higher up on that graph, the more intense the colour. And we can see that at low alum concentrations in the mordanting, where we had the mordant down at 5% weight of fibre, the type of cream of tartar that we use, that's what our COT is our abbreviation for cream of tartar, made very little difference at all. We compared no cream of tartar, baking cream of tartar, and Dyer's cream of tartar, and they were very similar at 5%, but at 15%, uh, you can see how the different cream of tartars performed. And I think this confirms to me the idea that the Dyer's cream of tartar is doing a better job. 
than the, the shop bought baking cream of tartar in getting a nice deep color. So moving on to the next slide, which is number 10, what you should see is the other way that we assessed our results was by the quality of the color, lemon or acid, a sh uh, yellow, a sort of sharp yellow or a straw yellow. And again, this photo isn't brilliant. I think the acid yellow here looks very pale and, and not so intense. Anyway, we grouped our 48 samples into two piles, those that we judged to be the zingy acid yellow and those that we judged to be the other tone. And the next slide, which is the slide number 11, has a, it's a frequency chart. All the 48 samples are represented here by um, colour, whether it's the yellow represents the acid tone, and that sort of olivey green colour um, is not the colour of the sample, but it represents the straw coloured tone. And this is taking a view of the data from uh, concentrating on the dye bath temperature and the mordanting conditions. And it's interesting to see that the top half of the table, the, the top six rows, you, which is where the dye bath temperature was uh, low-ish at 70 degrees centigrade or 160 F, uh, there were quite a lot of the acid tones appearing. Whereas the bottom half of the table, which is the hot dye bath, 90 degrees C or 195 F, there's many, many more samples that turned out to be the straw colour. And in one particular condition, which I'm going to try and help you find, which is the bottom half of the table. So it's um, the second row down in the bottom half is 90 degrees centigrade dye bath, 5% alum, baking cream of tartar, every single sample was the straw colour. So again, I'm, I'm preferring here that um, to keep the dye baths cooler, that obviously seems to give a brighter result with the, the, the more acid tones. But if we just look at the top half of the, of the table more closely, you can see that there were a few conditions where the straw colour crept in. It was at low alum, where the alum concentration was 5%. And the only situation where you got the acid tones in, in consistently was the dyer's cream of tartar at 5%, another vote, in my opinion, in favour of the dyeing cream of tartar. Um, so the no cream of tartar condition at 5% alum was just as light, almost, almost just as likely to produce straw as the baking cream of tartar. But down at, up at 15%, where the alum is stronger, no cream of tartar was perfect. It, it produced as many acid tones as the dyeing cream of tartar. Again, I'm using a value judgment here about the quality of the colours. So you can see there's, there's several things going on, probably a temperature effect. And then in addition to that, um, uh, something going on at the, at the low alum. So if we move to the next slide, which is slide 12, uh, we have a photograph of um, pairs of skeins. The left-hand column of skeins are mordanted at 15% alum. So this is before they went into the, oh, I'm having a message from Jenny. Let me just, oh, I've run out of time. Um, I shall stop and suggest that um, you come and have a look at the kiosk. Um, our conclusions really are what I've just said, that there's a temperature effect, there's also a cream of tartar effect, but Dyer's cream of tartar is more valuable. So okay. I'll Thank you leave it there. so much. That's brilliant. And I've literally run into question time because it was fascinating and we've also been struggling. So um, you're going to be in the kiosk for, and I'm sure anybody who wants to ask questions can come and find you or, or your colleagues. That's absolutely super. Thank you so much. Um, as, all right, here's your... F, F4 to, to applaud. Thank you very much. Or control F4 if you're on a Mac. So there we go. <laughs> okay, I'll have a, a little little pause while we change things over. That worked. That actually worked extremely well. Well done. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, our next next speaker is Debbie Bamford otherwise known as the Mulberry Dyer. Now, Debbie is currently working towards the highest qualification a practicing dyer can obtain in the world. 
Yes, you're there. <laughs> ASDCC Cole, you're going to have to tell me what that is, but I'll read the rest next. She's the honorary <laughs> treasurer of the Society of Dyers and Colorists, previously having been a trustee and their natural dye representative. I should say that nat the Society of Dyers and Colorists does not just mean natural dyes, it's everything. She's a historical dyer and researcher and with a small business producing naturally dyed yarns, fibres and cloths also, and principally serving the heritage industry. But she also serves the modern world. She's, uh, she's a consultant to industry on natural dye implementation into industrial processes. Debbie runs courses and workshops from beginners to master classes, and particularly on the subject of MADA. So, special welcome, Debbie. Um, very brave of you as a, as a technophobe to come and risk this. <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. I don't think I would be able to meet you any other way at the minute. Mm. So, a couple, I think the first question I have, what is ASDC? Uh, ASDC is an associate of the Society of Dyers and Colorists, and although it's letters after your name, it's actually um, the equivalent of an honours degree in dyeing. You can actually go and do a full mod moduled course for synthetic dyes. Unfortunately, at the moment, you can't do it for natural dyes. You have to do that by exemption, so you have to have been working with them and present and do an interview and have already um, an honours degree before you can be awarded an ASDC oh. the way I was. Wow, okay, so that's quite hard work then. C. Cole, am, am I going to guess that that's a chartered colourist? You're quite What's right, this? it is a chartered <laughs> colourist, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, we, we have C Chem in the Royal Society of Chemistry. So, um, yes, yeah. I guessed from that. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, sorry, do continue. No, I was just going to say, yes, we, we got our charter in 1963, I think it was. So we've right. been able to award charters, chartered colourist from then. That's brilliant. Now, um, I, I kind of mentioned it in the introduction, what your favourite dye is? Oh, well, it could be Rubia Tinctorum, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> right, that's brilliant. And I, you've, I, sorry. You've got a, you've got a, a lovely display um, in your kiosk too, so that people can also go and have a look and that we don't have to worry about um, technology showing slides and what have you because it's all there and you can scroll it yourself and Debbie will be there some of the time so you can chat with her on that. Okay, you. Now you you do all sorts of things. I've noticed. Uh, what are some of the some of the um, your favourite uh, heritage products projects that you've worked with? What were some of your favourite ones? Would you say uh, probably the blankets? I had a commission from Lindisfarne Castle um, oh. to work with um, an artist, an installation artist. And she, and Anya Galaccio, if you want the artist, and she was asked when they were um, renovating the castle a couple of years ago to put an installation in because they'd taken all the furniture and everything out of the castle. So she decided that as there's a Gertrude Jekyll garden there, she wanted to bring the colours of the garden into the castle and she would throw blankets all over the place. Um, so I had um, 20, no, 48 blankets to dye in various colours um, and we worked out the colours according to the plants that were in the Gertrude Jekyll garden. Obviously a lot of them were flowers as opposed to dye plants. So we had to go through the families and decide what the actual dye plant would be that would be the nearest to, to that one. So it was quite a complicated um, project to work on and was fabulous when it was up. That sounds fantastic. I'd love to have seen it. Uh, have you got that illustrated in your kiosk? Um, I don't know whether I have, but I will sort something out when it oh, comes. Just, just, yeah. Well, you've got a little while to do that. That's that's lovely. Um, and which industries uh, were you also in, involved with? 
which it owed. Um, well, the, the main project that I worked with was the carpet company. Um, we, hmm? um, the carpet company uh, was one of the oldest ones in the, in Yorkshire, um, mm -hmm. and one of the most prestigious. It was Crossley Carpets. Um, when they closed, some of the workers took over the looms and took over running the company. And then when they decided to finish, the daughter of one of those gentlemen carried on. And so she she came, carried on with a much smaller business and called it Avena Carpets. But she had the whole back catalogue of the carpet company. Um, all their patterns and everything dating back to the early 1800s. So she had an idea to produce naturally dyed carpets of the patterns that they used to do. Um, so we we got together and went into her dye house and did the sampling with large hanks of wool. We were doing 10 kilos at a time rather than one kilo at a time. Um, and then she produced the samples and then we did the testing to show for uh, light fastness, wash fastness and rud fastness because they have to be much higher on carpets, much, much higher grade than they are for clothing because of obviously the sunlight shining on them and everything. Um, anyway, we proved the natural dyes are pretty much a match for the synthetic dyes because we exceeded the standards on um, all of them. That's extraordinary. Brilliant. I'm trying to get something up on the screen to actually be pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, but uh, well, that's that's brilliant. Um, now, uh, I know you were um, I know you were worried that this would um, score you a lower mark or some such, but I, I gather you do um, some uh, reenacting as well. <laughs> I'm interested because I used to, I used to for a while. So, and I was Jenny the Dyer in um, the Society for Creative Anachronism. So oh, right. um, I've got a rather personal interest to know what you do with it, with your reenacting. So, well, actually very little these days, apart from I still work with the heritage industry and I still do the original reenactors market. And um, we do a lot of demonstrations for towns when when they're putting a like a tudor day on or um a medieval day or a hansa day or something like that then we will be booked to go and do a demonstration of dyeing or spinning or braiding or uh, john does woodworking he does pole lathe and and pin and needle making and oh we do paper mm -hmm. making so a variety wow. of different demonstrations that we can do for different periods. So I, I, I can dress myself from the Romans through to World War Two, and talk about quite a wide range of subjects. On Brilliant. That. OK. Well, that, that's lovely. I'm having spot a bother with that. I'm going to have to uh, going to have to stand myself up to do this properly. But uh, that's that's lovely. Um, I'm going to sort of throw it open a little bit here we've we've got um we have actually got time i'm going to unmute everybody and see if they would like to ask you some questions this time because it's uh, very much an interview type thing and i'm going to stand up for the moment there we go uh and now you've got a raise hand thing that you can do um the uh, right okay so if you i'm going to unmute everybody if i'm not unmuted anyway I'm unmuted. Okay, you're all unmuted, hopefully. Okay, Mel Sweatin, I've got her hand up fairly quickly there. Okay, Mel. Are you able to um, give your question? You can actually say, you know, say, or you can come up, up to the front if you like. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, little faith, but yes. Um, it's Mel Sweetnam. Um, thanks so much, Debbie. I'm just really curious. I know, because uh, I follow you on social media, I know that matter is your favorite dye, but I'm just wondering if you can expand on why. <laughs> um, I find it absolutely fascinating because it's got so many qualities and so many dye chemicals in it. And the challenge of getting it to do what you want it to do can be 
quite taxing <laughs> to say the least um and i love doing turkey red it's my favorite dyeing that answer the question everything's yeah. gone quiet oh it has hasn't it yeah <laughs> i was trying trying to put these things up on the on the board but i can't do it fast enough because i have to take over the control of the board and it's not behaving never mind well thank thank you so much we, we actually still got quite a bit of time to spare and I've left my script script in the other room. Otherwise, I would have asked a lot of other questions. So I apologise <laughs> if I'm skiing off piste slightly here. Um, but uh, if there's, there's anything, anyone else got something they'd like to know? Actually, uh, Mel asked 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 the one. Ah, oh, who, who have we got here? Judy Cavana. Judy, Judy, Judy. Would you like to say? Hi. I'd Hi. like to know what your recipe is for turkey red. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nothing a popular one. Secret, but in quite, general. <laughs> I, I do the old recipes. Um, so I go back to the originals um, written in the late 1700s and 1800s and um, tend to do workshops on it rather than just reeling it off. It's basically you do the oiling, then you do, well, you do the sheep poo, then you do the oiling, then you do the tannin, then you do the alum, then you do the dyeing and then you do the brightening. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, it takes a while. And that is on fabric or on? That's on cotton. It's on very cotton. specifically for cotton, but you can do it on linen as well. But not so much wool. You wouldn't do it on wool at all. It wouldn't work. Don't need to. Okay. You, you, well, you don't need to, but it's uh, the amount of work you're putting into it the, the wool would end up a, a felted mess i think <laughs> yeah that is a problem thanks okay you're welcome can i ask a question possibly <laughs> <laughs> please do <laughs> hi debbie um I was very lucky to come on your Turkey Red course at Carmarthen. I don't remember how many years ago. And I know what a fine teacher you are. Um, and we talked about this briefly yesterday when I visited you. I'm really, really concerned about the standard of some natural dye teaching at the moment. How would you, how do you, how do you view the situation of natural dye teaching in the UK at the moment? Do you think it's, you know, do you think more people are interested or do you think the widening of interest has maybe diluted the quality of the teaching. Uh, yes, I would go along with the the second comment there. I think I think it's fabulous that people want to know more about natural dyes, and I'd really encourage people to investigate it and look at it. And if you want to just potter around and do a bit of dyeing for yourself or do it with your children, then it's great to you know work with simple things like turmeric or onion skins or whatever but if you really want to know about natural dyes and you really want to get involved in producing stuff that you can sell i think it's so important that you go to somebody who can teach you properly and i would recommend you as well isabella you know but uh, or jane dean or jenny dean or helen melvin there are people in the country who have got a really in-depth knowledge um, and there are people who are just publishing because they can on the internet because you can publish whatever you like and that the information that's coming out is quite scary I think particularly as it's been raised by Susan about mordanting every book that comes out now that about that talks about mordanting it's like they've no idea what they're actually doing or what the chemistry is that's going on or why they should use this or why they should not use this and people don't want to use the mineral the metallic salts because they're so harmful but if you're using large amounts it's a problem if you're using sensible amounts and it's taken up by the fabric it's not a problem so it really is a very difficult subject now i think and finding somebody good is what you need to do thank you 
Thank you, Isabella. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, both of you.